Thank you uh, for those uh, wonderful introductions and welcome today. And thank you to Noel and to Langan for uh, sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us and acknowledging um, the sacred land that we're on. It's a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. David Renz, our keynote speaker today. I first came to know David in 2002 when I was a PhD student at the University of Victoria in the School of Public Administration. And I was working with Professor Vic Murray on a, non, on a nonprofit and voluntary sector uh, research project. And this project was on the adoption, the extent to which uh, nonprofit and voluntary sector organizations had adopted uh, computers, the internet, and software that the government of Canada had made available to them that they were a bit concerned about a decline in volunteerism and wanted to uh, make uh, tools available to recruit a new supply of volunteers. And as we were putting the fi finishing touches on our research, um, Vic proposed to me that there was a really great conference that we really needed to attend and uh, share and discuss our work. And this conference was the uh, conference of the Association for um, uh, nonprofit organizations or research in nonprofit organizations and voluntary action known as ARNOVA. And now, um, David probably doesn't remember meeting me at this conference, but I remember meeting David and other members of ARNOVA um, who I recall I was very impressed with. Uh, I was very impressed with the uh, quality of the research and the discourse around um, uh, nonprofit and voluntary uh, scholarship, um, but also the community that was built around it of scholars and people who are not only interested in scholarship, but where scholarship was emerging from, and that was from the ground and community. And um, having known David over the years, I've come to appreciate his passion uh, for nonprofit and voluntary sector research, but also his expertise and his mentorship um, and development of both community and scholars in the field. And I'm so happy that um, he was a he's able to share some of that knowledge with us today. Just uh, his bio is in the um, is in your packets, but I'll just uh, draw highlights to a few. Um, uh, things. Uh, he is the Beth K. Smith Missouri Chair in Nonprofit Leadership and Director of the Midwest Center uh, for Nonprofit Leadership, an education research and outreach center of the Block School of Management at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. The, the mission of the um, Midwest Center, which I have attended uh, many through many events there is really high quality, community oriented education, applied research and problem solving. And through his work over the last 25 or so years at the Midwest Center, he's really uh, developed an engaged and vibrant community of practice um, that benefits both the university and the community. Uh, in addition to all of the accomplishments in his bio, he is the 2017 recipient of ARNOVA's Distinguished Achievement and Leadership in Nonprofit and Voluntary Action Research Award that recognizes outstanding achievements in the field of nonprofit and voluntary action research and significant leadership achievements in the advancement and promotion of research over an extended period of time. David is no stranger to the cold. He grew up in Minnesota, where he earned his PhD in organization theory and design at the University of Minnesota. So let's give him a warm prairie welcome and thank him for being here today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Yvonne. It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Um, it's always interesting to hear and have your bio read. It's kind of a cross between an obituary and a promise, all in one. That said, I mean, and I appreciate your acknowledging the award I received, although I did call my wife after I'd been informed that I was about to receive it and said, okay, I've been officially declared old now. So, um, But I'm happy to be with you and share maybe some insights of some of the things I've learned while getting older, and specifically working in the academic environment. I, 
I want to thank you very much for the invitation to be with you today for this exciting, important event. Um, as we explore, you explore, but I'm delighted to be with you in talking about this as we explore how to take the work of the university, the community engagement, to a new level of, I'm going to watch my time here because I'm going to go on forever if I don't watch it. Looking at a new level of engagement in Regina, but also throughout the whole province, and I'm delighted that the effort has been made to connect the dots, connect the communications beyond just this room and this campus, as important as that is. The focus of today's forum, the question posed in the title, I think are especially timely and significant, and it's a pleasure to talk with you about your thoughts, and that's why we have multiple structures for engagement and interaction as we go through the session. We want to think about how your thoughts and experiences can be leveraged to achieve even greater impact and value for communities, citizens, and for our universities as we look ahead from this point. When it comes to working with universities and communities, I have a fair amount of experience, and from multiple perspectives, I am, as you know, um, a university the faculty member, as you heard, I direct a university-based nonprofit center. I'm proud that we've actually been acknowledged as one of the more most actively engaged community-based centers in the country and to some extent beyond. I'm proud of those connections between community and the academy. Uh, maybe part of what's helped that is that I also do have experience as a senior government official in the U.S., several years as an executive in a state government regulatory agency, and several years as the executive director of a uh, metropolitan regional planning and development agency for a region of about 2 million people, the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. And I also have some research that's relevant as well. Actually, early in my career, I invested a lot of time in studying community advocacy and protest movements and how they tried to make change and have impact in communities and how they linked with or fought against, depending on how it went, established organizations and community leaders to achieve success. All those experiences contribute to a perspective that I think helps me effectively lead a center and a university program, a center that in some ways is, is like your VSSN. Um, every one of these is a little different and should be, but our focus is very much to facilitate and bridge boundaries to get the academic practice worlds, those of us who live in those worlds, and of course, none of us lives in one of those places. We all have shared identities, places, and so on. And so it's interesting when we sometimes get so caught up or engaged or maybe even sometimes trapped in one setting that we, we forget about the other hats and opportunities. But as we work together, we can build the capacity and well-being of our communities and citizens our, uh, our tagline at the Midwest Center is actually building healthier communities through nonprofit leadership. That's not to the exclusion of government, but it is in fact recognizing the distinct role of the voluntary and nonprofit sector. I moved to Kansas City, it's a metropolitan region in the very middle of the U.S., about 25 years ago to develop this center. As I mentioned, we have a strong reputation for community engagement. I'm pleased to share some of the things that we've learned and that we've worked on as I go through uh, my presentation today. But please know that I'm sharing these as some examples of things that made sense for us in our community, working with our colleagues. They may be of use to you, but I will tell you right now, one of the phrases that many of my academic colleagues use that I greatly dislike is the phrase best practices. Until we understand the context the challenges, the life stages and needs of the communities and constituents we work with, we have no legitimate basis to say something is or isn't best. That's not to say there aren't better and worse things to do. And frankly, if you're a nonprofit agency, we're in favor of you having enough money that you stay alive. Survival's a good goal. Just shouldn't be the only one. So uh, I'm hoping that this discussion today, the structure that Yvonne and the network has set up will in fact be of value to your communities as you think about where are you today and where are you going? Our ideal, of course, is that this is a vehicle for dialogue that informs the ways that you can collectively work together and engage many more folks than are even in this room as you engage in what Yvonne referred to earlier as a community of practice to enhance the success of everyone in these relationships. And when we talk about the theme for today, realizing our potential for universities to contribute to community success, I'm thinking about how we can increase the frequency, the scope, the impact of engagement 
And frankly, I want to encourage you to think regularly about this as a relationship with all of the dimensions of complexity, but also the reciprocity and interaction that occurs in that relationship. I'm occasionally embarrassed. I don't believe this is a problem here, but um, I'm occasionally embarrassed with some of my colleagues in US universities that the only time the university arrives in a neighborhood or a community is when they're the subject of some study. And I have to tell you honestly, you know, I won't identify the institution by name. I once went to uh, St. Louis, another city in the middle of the US, to do a workshop on nonprofit agency boards. And somebody told me they were glad I came for something other than studying them, that the university down the road only showed up when it was time to get respondents for a survey or subjects for a study. And you know, I'll say candidly, that's the kind of relationship that we need to get beyond. I'm delighted to say everything I've learned about what's going on here and what you aspire to see moving ahead will move well beyond that. It's not that we shouldn't survey our community colleagues. It's great and important to know what's going on, what people need, how they see things. But if it's a relationship, we're there more often and more regularly and we're in dialogue. And that's part of what I hope to discuss. I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of the key things that I've learned in, uh, in some of the work that we've done. And then, and then frankly, I'll, I'll just share some examples of what we've been doing at the Midwest Center in case they are of interest to you. You know, it, it seems so logical when we talk about university community engagement. You know, you've heard already from the leaders of your institutions about some of the great things that are going on. It's kind of strange, you know, why don't we do this all the time? The benefits seem pretty obvious to everybody. But yet, when it's time for us to continue to grow and develop these things, to, to pursue even deeper relationships with each other, the reality is there's a myriad of forces that are out there that can undermine or delay our action and slow us down. For one, frankly, I've learned that the urgency of the short term and what's required of us, each of us, whether we're in a nonprofit agency, a government agency, a faculty role, whatever it is, the urgency of what we do day to day often gets in the way of progressing on bigger, longer term ideas and plans. It can be so challenging just to do the stuff you have to do every day that even though it's on the back of our minds to say, oh yeah, we should, there's an opportunity, we could go out and connect more. Oftentimes it's kind of like, well, I have to do that tomorrow as soon as I have time. And when do we have time? One of the exciting things about your forum today is that all of you working together can help encourage and create opportunities for each other to have time, to share time and make time, so that you can get to this level of greater engagement. Now, the truth is, even while everybody has talents and gifts worth sharing and leveraging, there's another issue as well. We don't always have the shared perspective about how to do this in a productive way. And so that's a key point that I'm delighted to see in today's forum. How we work with each other in community, taking the relationships and connections and linkages that you already have grown and developed, but you can take them to a next level, to an even more powerful level. And again, that notion of community of practice, when we're a community of people working to help each other grow, develop, and succeed, and take it to a new level of impact along the way. I think that's especially exciting here in Regina and in Saskatchewan because the launch of the next generation of this VSSN can work with you to be a vehicle and a resource to take the power of university community engagement to a new level. This is not new for you, of course. You're not starting at ground zero. I look around the room, I see the exhibits, I know from the backgrounds and the bios of our collaborators in this forum, there's a lot of wonderful work underway. And the reality is you're coming together as a community to share your understanding of what you've done and I think that's part of the real opportunity. Frankly, I hope you're here partly to celebrate the fact that in fact there is something here. There's a here, here, or a there, there, whatever. Um, you know, you may not even know it and celebrate it. And frankly, when you're a person like me who kind of gets these ideas and then you try, well, you charge off trying to get them done, Sometimes you forget to stop and recognize and celebrate the power of what has happened as we come together in community. And I encourage you to do that today, to celebrate with each other even what's happening now while talking about the possibilities for the future. 
I, invest, I commend you for investing your time in the forum. So the people who are here today are from multiple institutions, multiple roles, different disciplines and fields of practice. Everybody here understands that there's so much more that can be done when we work together across boundaries to capitalize on our diversity, all kinds of diversity, to share our talents and leverage our experiences. But engagement means that we're connecting, bridging, and developing relationships that cross boundaries that, quite honestly, I find often resist being crossed. In fact, those boundaries tend to be even tougher to get across in times of financial tightness, when we've got more work to do than ever. Uh, you just don't have the chance to sit back and say, how could we be more strategic? How could we leverage these things? Uh, the cliche in some of our work is that the urgent always drives out the important. And one of the things that we want to think about is, okay, let's, let's collectively grow a discipline to keep connected and think about where and how we can actually go. Some of the forces that work against us are just the natural conditions of life. But frankly, some of it is the real power and leverage comes of the diversity that's here. But the more you work with increasingly, sorry about that, with increasingly diverse environments, the more difficult it can be. And so that's where we need to set the foundation and understand work from shared principles on the way to actually leveraging these forces. In fact, I sometimes like to use the, uh, the metaphor of Aikido, and when I'm working with groups in, in uh, small workshops, I usually find out if there are any Aikido masters in the group. It's a martial art, mostly defense-oriented, but it's a martial art. Uh, I don't know if anybody here is an Aikido master or not. The truth is, um, Aikido is a wonderful thing as a metaphor, and I know nothing better about it than that. That said, Core principles of Aikido that I think are really important for us in our institutions at this time in our evolution, probably was always real, but is the Aikido master leverages the forces that are in play first to help keep them from hurting or damaging them, which is why this is an art of self-defense, but then to the extent you can, actually leveraging those forces to move in directions and achieve things that you want. And so the core principles of Aikido, this martial art, I think are actually relevant for us as we work across boundaries in our community. The principle of embracing those forces, but being flexible. The metaphor in a literal sense for you know, a Western guy like me is, all right, there's a force coming at me, they're trying to get me, so I'm gonna take it, I'm tough, I'm gonna put up with that. The Aikido master, Aikido if you've seen it, actually looks like a dance because the flow is so smooth. The master of Aikido sees that force coming, the person, even if they're coming to attack them, and they embrace them, but they then move out of the way. And it, it looks like a dance because it's kind of like you're being attacked from this side. So, oh, okay, you want to go there. So I will help you go there. It really is incredibly smooth. And of course, when you become a master at identifying, seeing, and then acting with those forces, we can at best, make them work to our benefit. And that's the whole idea of achieving synergy across the multiple disciplines, roles, community actions, things like that. One of the ways that I think has been really important, um, and in fact, it's a, it's a model that's developed in a fair amount of the United States. It's become popular, although I, I have mixed feelings about it, as I'll explain in a minute. Um, there's an approach for addressing complex problems and wicked problems. I'm sure many of you have thought about wicked problems and talked about them. Problems that are intractable, they transcend boundaries and silos and hierarchical lines because they're so complex. The approach, Yvonne mentioned it a little bit earlier on, as did Dean Griefenhagen, is the notion of collective impact. And there's a consulting group that kind of pushed it, and that was... Frankly, that kind of screwed it up. But the principles behind collective impact are really significant. And in fact, I've got, I have a few things that are on slides. By the way, we'll, we'll post the slides with VSSN if you want to take a look at these. But the point to make about the collective impact notion is that this is explicitly an approach that communities use when they have come to realize that there is no way to address a problem or a cluster of problems short of coming together to collectively address them because no single actors 
no matter how powerful they are, whether they're governmental actors, whether they're nonprofit actors, uh, whether the universities with the resources they have, no, no small cluster of actors can do this until they develop a relationship. And the notion of having a true collective impact to advance university community engagement means that you come together to develop a shared agenda. And I hope that our conversation today advances that idea, thinking about, well, what is the shared agenda that we collectively can come to? Each of us has our individual things we have to address, but then there are the things that join us. What are they? By the way, once you've identified that shared agenda, the second element of this approach is to actually say, how do we judge if we're making any difference? The, share, the notion of shared measurement, how would we judge? It's great to have wonderful things happening, but are we willing to actually be committed enough that we would say, we will, we will assess on a regular basis how we are growing and developing this kind of engagement for community impact? The essence of this that is already integral to your community and university engagements is the third of the elements, which is that a collective impact process includes all includes mutually reinforcing activities. Multiple stakeholders and organizations from multiple perspectives coming together, each to share their talents and gifts, whatever they can bring to the table that will help address the problem. And we're talking about how we will do it together as opposed to simply being a group of disparate actors who are doing things on our own in the hope that it will collectively add up to something. Some of the toughest problems we're dealing with I suspect some of the toughest problems you have in the province here are issues that aren't going to be addressed just by good action by individual actors. It's when we synthesize that energy and take it to a level that none of us individually can bring by ourselves, which of course means it's a relationship that requires regular communication, a core piece of what we're doing today. And frankly, the fifth of the elements that generally appears in a collective impact approach is that there is some kind of a backbone structure that helps organize, not run it, but facilitate it and support it. And to me, the VSSN network is essentially that kind of a notion. You know, it's not about running it, but it is about facilitating, hosting it. I mean, candidly, just like today's forum, inviting people to come together to say, what are we working on? What do we care about? Where could we best connect and, and energize ourselves? Now, I will tell you candidly, one of the values of the collective impact approach in the US has been undermined too often because it's been used by top-down structures to control people and tell them what to do rather than facilitate collective action. You've got a potential to do that in a completely different way. The, the lack of legitimacy that collective impact has earned in some parts of my country come from disrespected grassroots community values, principles, and legitimacy. But it doesn't have to be so. This is like all tools. The question is, is it being used well? Is it being used in a way that it can enhance building on the conditions and context of the communities we're serving and staying true or even surfacing and amplifying and making it clear what are the principles and values that collectively guide and inform what we do when we come together. So today as we're doing this, you're coming together as a community and we have this dialogue here and some of the questions that ideally we address in these kind of scenarios are questions like, what are those core principles and values that we share about the power of community university engagement and how we engage with each other? What are the talents, assets, and gifts that each of us can bring to that effort? And when and how should we best engage those gifts? I have worked occasionally in university settings where the rule was every faculty member needs to go out and be in the community doing the same things. That's crazy. We each have different talents, skills, and abilities. And frankly, I've got a couple of colleagues that I don't want to unleash on any nonprofit in town. I think we need to keep them in the corner doing research. And frankly, they're doing some spectacular research. And then others of us can help with the translation, the application, the sharing. Again, what are the talents and gifts that we uniquely can bring as a group that will help us go forward? 
and frankly, it's legitimate and necessary for us to understand what each of us, and by extension, the institutions and communities we represent, need to gain from our work when we invest in working together. Each of us has to answer, what do we need in our organization, in our roles, in the way of support and results so that it strengthens from this engagement initiative so that it strengthens our performance? These are relationships with all of the power and all of the messiness that comes from real, authentic relationships. But it is worth it when the result is stronger, healthier communities that meet the needs of all their citizens. Now, let me share a couple of things we've done at the Midwest Center in our work, um, specifically to try to live up to that in our community. I share this really just as food for thought um, as you're thinking about where we might go. So, and I apologize that the lightness in the room makes us a little hard to see, but the simple graphic here simply illustrates that the Midwest Center is part of intersecting with the community and the public university. The University of Missouri, Kansas City is a public university system in the middle of the country. Our mission is to enhance the performance and effectiveness of individuals and organizations in the nonprofit sector. And we do that through quality community-focused education, applied research, problem solving, and service. Our ideal is that we engage the resource and talents of, and the, by the way, this has actually been our founding statement since I got there. I didn't found the center, but the guy who created it then went and worked for a foundation and got rich, and I came in and kind of picked up the story and had a chance to actually paint on a fairly blank uh, portfolio. But our, our focus from the beginning, the center engages the resources and talents of the university and the nonprofit sector to address the challenges and issues facing our communities so its members are better prepared to serve. So our vision is that we're a center for learning, we're a center for education, uh, inquiry, and dialogue, and we're a center to support, and by the way, I think this is increasingly critical, we're a center for renewal of people and organizations working in community because there are times when this stuff gets really hard and we need to pull away a little bit and just support each other as we're doing this hard work. So we work on growing community capacity. We work on strengthening governance and the effectiveness of boards. I work a lot with nonprofit and governing boards. Um, we work on improving nonprofit and agency accountability and, eff and effectiveness. We're doing a lot of development work trying to help people figure out how do we do this well and respectfully in ways that enhance our potential to have an impact for the future in the community. And a lot of that includes facilitating service integration and collaboration so that actors in the community can work together better. So we do education and training. Uh, we, we produce uh, informational reports. We do some online webinars, not as many as we should, frankly, but we do some of those. We do non-credit public workshops. We do graduate level courses that actually have half graduate students and half community members in sitting in on the classes. I will tell you candidly that those classes are the ones that nonprofit leaders most want. What's the single most popular topic? You know what it is, it's fundraising. We have nine fundraising classes. I mean, they have different facets of fundraising. One's on grant writing, one's on major gift solicitation. I mean, all those kinds of things. But part of the, part of the connection there, similar to what some of you are doing as well, is you know, we've got seats for both folks, both groups uh, to come and come together and they learn. We have certificate programs. Uh, we do facilitate and support service learning, just as many of you in this room have been doing. Uh, of course, we do have conventional degrees for those who are most serious about it. We also do research, and our goal is, is sometimes to develop new knowledge. But I'll tell you candidly, one of the critical things that we have been most appreciated for, at least that's what they tell me, is that we understand the research so that we can help people in the practice community make sense of what's going on. We can help them apply it. Now, this is going to astonish most of you, but it turns out that several of my academic colleagues who are incredibly bright write in ways that nobody can make sense of what they're saying unless they were right there in the writing process with them. You know, I'm a translator. There are things we do to translate because good research is one kind of thing, and then explaining and helping people put it together and interpret it and figure out what might I do with it 
that's where the Midwest Center comes in and we're able to leverage some great stuff that our other faculty colleagues do, but we become a host and a vehicle for connecting the dots. And we try to do that um, with consultants and, and academics. We do it at times just in the community. There are many different ways to do that. So we're sometimes translating. We're always trying to facilitate engagement, but it's two-way engagement. Our engagement approach is Yes, let's take the best of research and theory out and share it with practice communities so that people can manage, lead, and perform more effectively. Equally important is let's find the best, most effective, and inventive entrepreneurial kinds of thinking and strategies that are out there and bring them into our classrooms and our research and host exchanges so people, you know, I mean, we bring the folks doing that work in the community into the classrooms. We take our students, just as many of you do, we take our students out. Well, I shouldn't say we take them out. They go out. And I have the privilege of working largely with graduate students who are mostly employed in the community already, so we have those linkages as well. We also focus on, no, it's not moving now. We also focus on the idea of, of um, doing a few projects that we call community facilitation projects because one of the things that we're able to do is to be a, a neutral party in facilitating complex and somewhat contentious discussions in community at times. And so when we have folks, and it might be as narrow as a couple of organizations that are thinking about merging, or something like that, or it may be that, uh, in fact, it's going to be, uh, uh, well, frankly, lately we've been helping um, these complex collective initiatives figure out who actually is out there doing what. We just recently finished a, a, a community mapping initiative where we we're mapping who are all the organizations that say they're working on the issue of childhood obesity, which is a real problem in our region, and what are they doing? They don't know who, I mean, they all know some of the other folks in the game, but who else is in that network? Who else is making an impact in that regard? So what does that mean for VSSN? I mean, that's what you're here to talk about today, and I'm not going to tell you that I think there's something you should or shouldn't be doing. It's got to make sense here. I do think VSSN is going to be beneficial if it's a trusted community that nonprofit community and university leaders all count on to help grow and develop the relationship in the center to be that resource, to be a skilled convener, to be a partner and a collaborator, so that you can help enhance the effectiveness of nonprofit executives, the community at large, faculty, students, connecting the dots in lots of different ways. So I'm gonna to go to this last slide and conclude with this. My invitation to you or at least my echo of the invitation that so many of our previous speakers have offered to you, is this. How might you start, not from scratch, because you're not starting from scratch, but how might you take this to the next level up? Is there a role in convening, in educating, engaging, listening? There's always a role for listening. Experimenting. Sometimes it's even just creating a space a social space where folks can come together as you have today to support each other, to share, to celebrate, help people evaluate and learn. And to go back to the, uh, to the celebration point and conclude with that, I, one of the things I do is teach change leader, transformational change leadership. And one of the things that's so critical in, in broad scale transformational change is to identify and celebrate the small wins. Because this is hard work. The important things we're dealing with, some of the things I understand you're dealing with in this community, but we have similar analogous challenges and issues in our part of the world as well. It doesn't happen fast. So let's help each other sustain and enhance the motivation, encourage and celebrate, because one of the things we know in change leadership is that it's acknowledging the small wins and knowing why and what it is about them that really makes it worth staying in the game that's so powerful. You're all here because in some respect, you each have some piece of a small win story to share. And I don't mean to be pejorative, maybe some of you got some huge wins too, but 
I just find in most of my work, it's hard to, it's hard to find a lot of huge wins because these are complex problems. Otherwise, we wouldn't be messing with them. And no disrespect to my for-profit business colleagues, we like to connect the dots with them as well. But the truth is, people go into business to make a profit when the market exchange works. Civil society, the voluntary sector, why are we here? We're here to address conditions where the market, the free market, the political systems, they leave some holes. Holes that can't be addressed except when we come together and bridge across those boundaries. I know you're doing it. The opportunity and or the challenge is, what's the next stage for you? I can't wait to see. And you're all here today to talk about it. Thank you very much. So uh, we are going to have a bit of a time for some questions. Uh, I'm not sure where people can go. I thought there was supposed to be a mic. Oh, there's a mic there, so uh, that would be helpful so everybody can hear your question. Just a reminder to make sure your questions are questions and not another keynote <laughs> address, please. All right? <laughs> so anybody would like to ask? We're ready. Thank you for that. That was great. I'm just curious, what motivates you personally to do the work that you do? Well, obviously it wasn't to get rich. I, I warned my spouse early on in life that for whatever reason, I have this screwed up, you know, I mean, I, my, as you heard, my doctorate's in organization theory and design. I love understanding organizations. But you know what's really fascinating is how you end up with organizations clustering together in networks and other things to achieve even greater impact for community. And for whatever reason, I'm just wired weird or something because that's what excites me. And then, you know, like all of us, it's fun to come into something where your insights and knowledge that you've developed actually seem to be valued and, and somehow make a difference once in a while. And I will tell you candidly, I need small wins like everybody else does. But, you know, when you're, in, for those of you who are faculty members, you know, you love it when you're in a classroom and you see a student and it's kind of like, whoa, that's how that works. Or that's how that could work. And, you know, I mean, some people get excited about that. Some people maybe don't care. But for me, that's exciting. And, and I love it when folks see the possibilities when we come together and I can facilitate. Our role, by the way, I didn't say this in the speech, but it's part of that convening and facilitating. I consider our role very much analogous to the chemistry concept of a catalyst. If we do our job best, we come in and facilitate a reaction that yields a new result, but there's no residue of us left in it because then that's us accidentally interfering with the system and the community that we should not be messing with. We should just be helping them. And I find that exciting. And for those of you who have psychology or social work background, maybe you can help me figure out what else is wrong with me, but that, <laughs> that kind of keeps me in the game. Come on, you're all itching to ask something. They're afraid of another long answer. <laughs> So we'll just ask you to rephrase it. And it's mainly because for the benefit of the people watching from a distance, they, they get it. I like the, when you talk about the gaps between industry and commerce and transactions. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, in a sense, I almost regret having to give credit because I love to make fun of economists. But the core of what I'm talking about is economists and how they describe things. And the, in general, and I, it's not the only reason nonprofits emerge, but nonprofits emerge when, and frankly, we tend to have an ethic very strong in the US, I wouldn't presume to speak about Canada, but there's an ethic that when you can, when a business can come in and through free market exchange make money, you can do it and you know, as long as it's not unethical or inappropriate or abusive, then you know, government shouldn't get in the way and nonprofits don't belong there. So the economist label, which isn't meant to be pejorative, it's meant to be descriptive, is market failure occurs when 
the economic transaction somehow doesn't work. And the illustration I was using just the other day with a group was we have food banks in our community who distribute food. And in a, in a sense, you could say, well, they're competing with the, the um, there's, a, there's a, a grocery chain called Hen House. So they're competing with Hen House to sell food. But of course, they're not competing because the people who can afford to go to Hen House do. The people who can't don't get food unless there's some way to intervene. So in cases of market failure, the next layer, and this is where you see a lot of difference, frankly, in between nonprofit and non-governmental constructs, if, if government, if people look at a problem and say, we have the political will to address it through a government program, they'll create an agency or something like that, and government will meet the need and we'll tax ourselves or find some governmentally oriented way of funding it. But when that doesn't happen, the political will's not there, and in the US and I think in much of the rest of the world right now, we're really reconceptualizing what the role of government is in all our communities and systems. But when market failure exists and government failure exists, then the question is, what do you do? And in some parts of the world, people just complain and say, gee, government's screwing up. In the US, we have a fascinating tradition of voluntary action where lunatics, I mean, um, dedicated citizens step forward and say, no, this can't happen. We can't let this go on. And so they coalesce and they step into this place where these failures of market and government exist. How do they do it and sustain it? Well, that's where tax exempt status, volunteer labor, um, all sorts of things like that, in-kind support from vendors and companies, they all help make a difference. So, sorry, another long answer. I uh, believe we have time for one more question, especially if it comes with a long answer. Uh, <laughs> anybody else? Thanks. Um, you've given us some ideas of the nuts and bolts of how you do your education um, component with, um, you know, courses and online resources and things. Could you talk a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of um, your research and knowledge translation? Do people approach you for that? Do you identify um, issues and go out to the community? And similarly with the, um, the projects that you identified, how, how does that actually work, say on a year-to-year -year yeah. basis? Well, I mean, the challenge we have, as is true for most institutions and folks, is that we do have to cover our costs. And I have a little bit of a benefit, which also guides part of what I do. My position is an endowed chair in nonprofit leadership. And basically what it means is that half the cost of my position is funded by an endowment. But interestingly enough, the Kansas City Committee's community's civic leaders came together and funded about 25 years ago. And their argument was, we want a professor at the university who is dedicated to helping nonprofits and civil society organizations become stronger and perform well. So they couldn't find anybody good, they hired me instead, and I started doing this work. And um, frankly, part of what we started off in the early days trying to do was to grow what you already have, which was some early stage networks and connections and linkages reflected by what's going on in this room. But trying to help people see how we could add value and just keep telling people what the principles were and working through it and trying to then leverage it um, in other settings. You know, if we do a project for, a, I mean, some of the things we do is like consulting, but we don't, our goal is not to grow as a consultant, to grow a client who will be dependent on us forever. Our goal as a client, as a consultant, is to build the capacity so that organization doesn't have to come back to us. They've now learned from us, and we've built the capacity into the organization to keep doing those things. And so I'll tell you candidly, a lot of it's word of mouth. I happen to be particularly interested in and engaged in, in research in a couple of areas, uh, board and governance effectiveness and, um, and organizational effectiveness. And so I have done, you know, my academic part of my work requires me to publish, but I will say 
part of what I've done with my time is for, in those two subject areas, I regularly work with magazines, and frankly, I had to kind of start trying to reach out and see if they were interested in talking with me, but uh, we work with magazines that are not orient, they're not the scholarly journals for the academic stuff. I have to do that for my, you'll excuse the phrase, but my academic brownie points, because I am a tenured professor. But I have diverted some of my time, uh, and I've had the latitude to do that because of the center work, to write articles that are not the new research. They're about the application. They're about the processing and, frankly, synthesizing it. Um, for those of you, there's a magazine in the U.S., I mean, it's got broader circulation, called the Nonprofit Quarterly. And I'll say candidly, I thought there needed to be a journal that would not be scholarly, but be strong and, and legitimate that would step in between practice and the research and theory world that the conventional academics had to do. I happen, and this is where, by the way, key insight, serendipity is really critical. I, I encountered the people who were starting the nonprofit quarterly at the time they were starting it. And I said, I'm glad you're doing this because then it means I don't have to try to start this other kind of journal or magazine. And they said, well, what would you do in it? And we just started talking. And then they said, well, what, what should we be covering? And you know, why don't you try something? And frankly, they tried me out. Um, I'll have to own up to something else. A lot of my colleagues call me a pracademic. I'm a practitioner academic. I mean, as I mentioned, I'm a former government official. Uh, I've run nonprofit agencies and all of that. I understand from my own career work as well as what we do in the community, what some of the biggest challenges are. I'm not the only person who understands that, but so I became connected with the magazine. And so, you know, not being overly creative about it. I've written about boards, for example, the research on boards probably a half dozen times for the quarterly, and every time the title is a few more pieces to the puzzle, how to make sense of boards and governance. And what I do is look at the whole body of research that I'm tracking around boards and governance, and then try to boil it back to what are the core nuggets that a practicing manager or board leader would care to use or might want to know uh, along the way. And frankly, you know, the quarterly got positive feedback from the articles, and so they kept allowing me to write. And so, you know, I mean, about once every year, maybe a couple times a year, I've done something twice, I guess, this year for the quarterly, I'll write articles that are about applying that. There's something coming out in the immediate future on networks and net the concept of networked governance. And so they called me up and said, well, you were working on this. You should do the intro to the issue. So I just finished that. And again, it's about, the difference is if you're a conventional academic, you're usually having to do your own research. But once I've managed to get enough of the brownie points to be the tenured academic, I've shifted a lot more to the application side and the synthesis side, which frankly has actually worked well in the academic world later because now I keep getting invited to write, you know, literature reviews on the field of, you know, a certain, sections of the field, and so that's where it goes back and forth. One of the things we did to try to bridge the gap as we started the second, third year I was there, we created a biennial conference, almost always on governance, that um, Yvonne was alluding to those earlier on, and that conference is explicitly a conference for researchers and practitioners, and it's structured with some of the characteristics of an academic conference, because otherwise the academics can't get support to come and present their papers. But the structure of the conference is that we, half the conference is facilitated discussion sessions where there is a topic, but no designated presenter. In fact, we have facilitators from our team who are there to facilitate and make sure that a presentation doesn't break out. Because let's face it, who comes to these conferences? In particular, it's executives with a lot of experience, academics who are doing research, and consultants who are working in the field. I mean, hey, any one of those folks would love to give you an hour lecture on anything at any time. So, so we've actually you know, tried to host and create some things that are bridging intermediate kinds of pieces. Most of our focus is not national stuff. Our aspiration as a center is not to be a national leading center. The only areas we really do leading work in, intentionally in, in this, uh, in, what we do is in the areas of governance and boards because it's my academic focus as well and the organizational effectiveness in the third area actually 
um, because we're in a school of management is social entrepreneurship. But um, the idea is to, is to connect the dots. And so we're always trying to find ways to make those intermediary and bridging steps. And frankly, we've tried to do the same thing in the community and facilitate things with the community. So there you go, that was another long one. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, we're really over time now. No, no, I'm just, just joking. So, um, hmm, uh, we are, pardon? I, sorry, I can't read lips. <laughs> I think she wants you to read the script. Oh yes, yeah, I know, I know, I know. Well, I, I have, I have the script here in another, another way. So um, we are going to. I, I'm just thinking of people's energy. That's, that's what I was thinking of. So uh, what we're going to do? We, we have a break coming up, but it's going to come up after the next bit, which is the institute. We're going to move to the uh, institutional. Uh, in, uh, level, uh, so the university community engagement uh, panel will start. But I think it might be really good for each, all of us, you know, maybe to stand up and stretch yourselves and take a deep breath, but then don't go anywhere, sit right down again. <laughs> yeah. And and while, um, while you're doing that, I'll ask the members of the panel uh, to please come forward and occupy these chairs. So that would be Noel Starblanket, Patricia Elliott, Bettina Schneider, and Rhonda Rosenberg. I, I had this here. I, I, I knew it's over there, so.